showing them that we can provision an environment zero to everything in 15 minutes. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about digital haberdashery and how I got into this business. Um, so I started uh, in my career at Sony Online Entertainment, uh, working as a game developer, where I met a good friend of mine and now business partner, Andrew Risch. Uh, Andrew had started a site in 1998 on April 1st called Polycount. This was about, the, this is right around the Quake 1 release, Quake 2 was getting ready to come out, and the game modding scene was starting to be a thing. Um, before then, modding games was really prohibitively difficult. You were trying to mod like NES cards and things like that, but now this has come to the PC and you had these models, you had decent modeling software, and you could do just about anything that you wanted. And so this community that he built slowly started to grow, slowly started to attract game developers. Very, very early on, uh, you know, in, in the kind of game development industry, there weren't schools, there weren't things like the Guild Hall or anything like that. And so we kind of, you know, this, this Polycount project grew and it kind of became unofficially known as Polycount University. This is where game artists came to learn their craft. This is where people, you know, people from all kinds of backgrounds, generally kids, you know, 16, 17, they wanted to make games. And so we did this for, you know, probably a good, you know, of, of the 16 years we've been around, going on 17 now, we were just serving these artists. We were doing competitions, things that game studios, you know, they hire you and you're like, we're going to need you to have five years of experience in these specific tools that you're never going to use outside of the game industry. And so you had to actually get these students and all of these people these skills. And the only kind of way you did that was with this community. And so for a long time, we were just this community. Um, so eight years, Drew and I are just working in the game industry, supporting this on the side. We're paying the bills out of our own pocket. Um, good friends of ours, uh, namely Adam Bromo, uh, who's now actually left us to go work on his game Astroneer, uh, as well as my friend Vittorio Miliano. We were keeping this alive just out of the goodness of our hearts. Um, this was our, and Drew likes to call this his karma machine. He thought, if I keep this site around long enough, eventually this will come back and give, you know, do some good for me, for the world, for something. Um, Drew's a really awesome guy, and he's, you know, he's, he's been approached uh, very long ago. If you, anyone remembers GameSpy, they totally tried to buy us, um, which, was, which is funny because we said, no, we're, we're going to be something big someday. And so, fast forward a few, uh, many, many years, and in 2010, we did a competition with Valve. Has anyone heard of Valve? There's a really small game studio in Bellevue. Um, so Valve makes this thing called Steam. And Steam has digital marketplaces for all this kind of content creators. They can just upload weapons, you know, rocket launchers, hats, um, and all kinds of things into the games. And so we had always wanted to do a Valve competition. But the problem is Valve is Valve. And they don't really work in a normal world. Uh, they kind of do things on their own time, and getting them to do something with you officially is very hard. So what you do with Valve is you just do a really cool, like, kick-ass set of, you know, models or something, and then you put them up publicly, and Valve's like, oh, we like those, and they'll put them into the game. So this was our plan. And it went off smashingly. Uh, in, uh, in, tw in 2010, we actually released into TF2 a pack called the Polycount Pack. Every single one of those was an artist who had built an entire set of weapons for a character. Um, and these characters, uh, if you're familiar with TF2 characters, are different, you know, character sets. And we had all of these people competing, and they had to do a whole set, you know, for their individual characters. And so, we didn't think anything of this. You know, we thought it was awesome. I mean, we were super cool, we were super great that we were working with Valve. Valve called us wizards, we took this to heart. Um, so if you actually ever need to email us, we're actually wizards at polycount.com is our alias. Um, and so this is just, I'm just showing uh, game art. Uh, so this is just, this is my community, this is what they make. Um, it's everything. Everything that you see in games. Um, I just signed a legal release with Square Enix yesterday to put our logo in a game. Um, it's, it's totally open for you to use. It's Creative Commons, but at the same time, game studios like to not be sued. So, we are going through this car machine process, and as, we, as this TF2 pack hit, what Valve had introduced is a way for these content creators to make money. Several of our friends and winners of this competition quit their jobs because in the first week, they made on the order of like $50,000 from weapon packs in a game. And this is really hard to explain to my parents still to this day, um, but my friends sit at home making hats over and over again. Hats with little like chests where an octopus comes out of the chest and grabs things. And this is normal. Um, there's, a, there's a great TF2 picture that shows like a character wearing like 52 hats stacked up. 
And Valve made this game free to play because they realized there was more money in the digital marketplace than there ever was with in the box copies of the game. And so we were really, really psyched. Like, like I said, many people quit their games. We were giving back to our artists. Except we didn't really make any money off of this, which wasn't bad. Again, this is our karma machine. But Valve was like, you know, we want to find a way to give back to the communities who give us all this content because they need the content just as, you know, just as much, you know, because they can't make the games free to play unless they have this content. And so uh, we worked with Valve in 2013, and we came up with a, what Valve calls the service provider program. Now, when you're a content creator, it's a very, it's, the Steam platform is very much like an app store model. You go in, Valve gets, you know, the 70%, gets the large cut, you get 30%, they do all the hosting, distribution, versioning, validation, all that fun stuff. But what they said is, you can give up to 5% of our cut, Valve's cut, back to an artist of your choice, or back to you, sorry, not an artist, but a community of your choice. And we were actually in the room with Valve before they had actually released this, um, and they actually had us on the list, and it was, Polycount was the first thing there. And we were like, wow, why'd you guys do that? And they're like, that's because all of our content creators said that's what needed to be on there first. And then after that, you have sites like Facepunch, Reddit, and a few others. And so we were really excited. We we're going to get you know, little bits of 5%. And I was thinking, well, you know, maybe we'll make some money. So we did a competition in December of 2012. Sorry, it was 2012, not 2013. Uh, December of uh, 2012. And it's for uh, Dota 2, which is a small, again, very small game that I think a few people in the world play. And we had all these items go in. And so January, we're waiting with kind of bated breath. You know, what's, you know, we're waiting for that first check. And we get a $7,000 check. And again, we're a little bit underwhelmed, but we're still thrilled because $7,000 is more than we have ever made in the history of Polycount. And then three days later, it's kind of like that Monopoly card, like there's been a bank error in your favor. Um, Valve is like, yeah, we're not so good at math, decimal places and everything. It was a $49,000 check off of just the 5%. So we started making money. And we had no idea what we were doing because we had day jobs. We were not incorporated as an LLC. We weren't sure how much, you know, how long this would last. We were like, maybe it's a fluke. Next month, ten thousand dollars. Month after, twenty-seven thousand. Our revenue is incredibly spiky because it's all dependent on these games. So we go through the year, 2013, and Valve decides to hold uh, Steam Developer Days in 2014, which is, you know, kind of evangelizing these digital marketplaces. And so they get up and they're talking about content creators and we get this nice little slide with the Polycount logo. And the best part was it wasn't just the Polycount logo, it was two other products that were actually born out of our forums. Uh, so uh, there's a, a product called Marmoset uh, that is a 3D topology program. And that was actually born out of scripts on our forums. And we've kind of, we, we got to this point where we realized that we are now, we're now kind of being able to feed this money back into our community. So we can feed this back into better contests, we can feed this into kickstarting our friends' games, we can you know, start funding events that we really believe in, so things like AlterConf trying to, and I Need Diverse Games. And so we, we had this revenue, but obviously there are problems once you start making money, um, because you have to pay people and there's this pesky taxes thing. Um, and as I found out, you can't have foreign nationals be on your board if you're a United States-based company without giving the government 20% of your money. Um, so one of the lessons we learned very long is hire an accountant. Please, God, hire an accountant. It'll make your life so much easier. And so the first year ends, uh, and we had made $350,000, which is more than I've ever, I've never seen a check that large. Um, also, that's a lot of taxes, as I found out. So. What we've done is now we're two years into this kind of project. We've formally incorporated as an LLC, and we're trying to diversify our markets. That is our big challenge right now, is we are kind of attached to the hip, to Valve. And that's, granted, it's a really good wagon to be hitched to because they print money. At the same time, we are trying to serve our artist community. Um, so this is, again, all about the artists. This has never been about the money for us. This is about giving back to them in a good way. And so Drew now, you know, his karma machine has paid off. He works full time on Polycount. He doesn't have to do anything at all ever again for the rest of his life, you know, seeing if Polycount succeeds. Um, so we're looking at dealing with uh, other digital marketplaces. So if you've used the Unreal Engine from Epic, they have a marketplace that we've been talking to. We're trying to get ourselves into all of these, get our hooks into as many of these games as we can because 
the future for a lot of these game artists is not sitting in a AAA studio with 300 other artists and just grinding out content. Artists now have the ability to pick and choose what they want to work on and where they want to work because of free market economies and a lot of these digital marketplaces. Um, so it's changing the way that they work as well as the game industry works. Um, a lot of, you know, the indie kind of, you know, I mentioned my, uh, one of our uh, original folks, Adam, who's been with us for about 10 years um, and just left to go work on Astroneer. The game industry has shifted. Um, how artists are compensated, how content creators are compensated, as well as how games are made. Um, so kind of uh, driving the kind of tool sets and kind of supporting those tool sets that allow people to create art very, very easily and very, very quickly without the kind of overhead of, you have to go buy, you know, Autodesk, you know, some kind of Autodesk product that costs $5,000 or something absolutely ridiculous. Um, so we've been very proud. And the best part for us is at one point Autodesk came to us to ask to advertise and there's nothing better if you've worked in the game industry than taking money back from Autodesk. <laughs> because, good God, that's expensive stuff. But we've also worked with them. Uh, and, and so to, you know, to make it clear that Autodesk is not you know, the big evil one, they've realized the value in these, in these communities. And they've started to invest in communities like ours. So the advertising is actually them investing. And tr you know, we're like, hey, could you bring the tool prices down on these? Or hey, have you looked at doing revenue sub you know, subscription models for your tools instead of this big $5,000 ticket? And slowly, we've been able to shift how they think and how they actually recruit people and how they go in, you know, how they are actually advertising to these, uh, these people and these students. And so one of the things that I'm now very passionate about and we're trying to, uh, we're trying to do something about, um, I had the, a, Posts. So we used to have moderated posts. So somebody has, comes to the site, they want to join, they have to put up a post. And the post said, hi, I'm 11 and I'm using Unity and I'd like some help with JavaScript. And then I had a very parent moment where I realized, oh God, there are children on my website. <laughs> and I know my community and it's, it's a bunch of cranky game artists and they're very critical and they're, you know, they're known for their scathing critiques and all of, those, all of those other kind of fun, like very, like, you know, very competitive art folks. And I, was, I decided, oh God, we need to not only make this accessible, but we need to make this a safe place for kids because this is, these are our new content creators. And they are like, you look at kids playing Minecraft right now. They are the next generation of content creators and they need the tools and the education. So something that we've been trying to push a lot of is supporting educational initiatives. Um, so, you know, girls make games, I need diverse games. Um, there's, you know, so we do black girls who code and trying to get these young content creators the, the, the tools and the skills that they need and also, again, the safe space because that's what we've, we've wanted to do. We've done this for our artists for a long time, but we realize that it's a much bigger world. We want to pull in programmers, we want to pull in designers, sound engineers, everything, but again, make it, make it a nice safe space. So our challenges are, you know, right now is, is what I'm trying to do is find a business plan that doesn't involve depending on Valve to give me money from the sky. Um, and so I work in business development in my day job, and I'm like, well, how do we forecast revenue? And I've talked to everyone that I've, everyone I've talked to has said, oh, well, you're kind of on your own there. No one knows how that market works. We stay away from that thing because it's unpredictable. Um, so what we're, what we're trying to do now is find a way to continue to keep ourselves alive, but also, uh, you know, not necessarily continue to make money, but continue to support all the initiatives that we started. So that's all I've got, but I'd love some questions if anyone has any.